Our next speaker, who has also already joined us, is um, Johnny McCullough. And he um, was born and raised in Santa Cruz, went to Cabrillo College, and transferred to UC Santa Cruz, where he got his bachelor's degree in robotics engineering. He has worked for Fox Suspension, Apple, and he's now at an autonomous vehicle startup called Aurora Innovative Innovation as a hardware reliability engineer. And fun fact, he met his wife at engineer, in Engineering 5 at Cabrillo, actually. So I think you're the second husband-wife couple we've had in this class, Johnny. Oh, is that true? Is there, is there another? Yeah, we had um, a couple from civil engineering join us a couple weeks ago. There's something something about engineering and romance. <laughs> so, Johnny, do you want to talk about, um, I know that you had a lot of advice about um, your internships and some of the work you've done. Maybe you could start with that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so while I was actually going to Cabrillo, um, more than a decade ago now, it doesn't seem like that much time has passed, <clears throat> I was able to land a, an internship with Fox Suspension, which was really cool. Uh, um, so I was, I was still going, you know, doing my physics classes at Cabrillo, going through math, um, going through a lot of, you know, like statics and dynamics classes. Uh, but was pulled in for this internship uh, in their test lab. So I got to basically see all the different products Fox makes uh, as a suspension company. So all the suspension products would come to the test lab and would have to basically come up with different ways to test these things as if they're gonna be used in the field and really beat up on them to make sure they weren't gonna fall apart for people that were riding mountain bikes or uh, you know, driving in their off-road vehicles. So the really important part of the product development work there. Um, and that's where I was really introduced to uh, mechatronics. So this, this idea of kind of fusing um, mechanics and computers. And I was really, when I was at Cabrillo, I was really leaning towards either like a civil engineering degree or more of a mechanical degree. But um, kind of once I got my hands on embedded systems, like Arduino was starting to get really big back then. Um, any sort of microcontrollers uh, and kind of using those and applying those within the test lab at Fox. Uh, it really kind of steered me towards wanting to do this, uh, this mechatronics degree that, you know, had a little bit of everything and it had some EE, some ME, um, computer science. It was, it was really, uh, it was really more of a generalist kind of degree that, uh, I just connected with. So that was what, that was my push to go to UCSC. Um, it was kind of convenient to um, continue to work and yeah. Do you think Cabrillo prepared you well to jump into um, a degree for where that combines so many things like electrical engineering, mechanical engineering and stuff like that? Most definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, all the foundational stuff is really important for any engineering degree. Um, and they all kind of, even as you specialize, you get deeper into electrical engineering or mechanical engineering. There's, you know, analogies that run across, you know, circuits and mechanics and inductors and dampers and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, all the foundation that I, I took away from Cabrillo was amazing. Uh, you know, you're learning stuff in relatively small class sizes that at a university would likely be learned in a, you know, an amphitheater with hundreds of other students where it gets a little more impersonal. So, yeah, you know, having some of these smaller classes at Cabrillo and um, the curriculum is really second to none from my experience, uh, just from what I experienced at uh, University of California and then what a lot of other friends experienced who are also went to get rid of and went, you know, traveled across the country, different schools. That's great. Um, and 
Where are you working now? Oh yeah, the uh, what are you working on in your current job? Because I th or I think everyone would love to hear about your experience at Apple before you got to your current job, actually. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> one of my coworkers from Fox, who was uh, turned into a good friend, uh, got kind of poached out of Fox for this kind of secret project that was being worked on at Apple at the time, and. He took off, and I ended up connecting with him maybe a year or so later. Um, he reached out and said, hey, how would you like to work on, you know, this kind of crazy thing Apple's doing? And I, and I was like, let's check it out. So I got pulled over uh, and interviewed, and it was really like they are, they're very secretive about stuff uh, to a point where it's a little silly, but um, went through this basically an, an all-day interview, a, a new interviewer comes in and kind of grills you for an hour and then another one for an hour, another one for an hour. And by the end, you're just exhausted. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I got, so they gave me an offer and I was like, yep, got to check out what Apple's doing. Um, and I got put on this uh, kind of autonomous vehicle project that they're working on. It's still, still secret. Everybody kind of knows what they're doing, but they don't tell anybody. Um, and it was just incredible. It was crazy to see what a company with, basically all the money does <laughs> with that money um, and the resources they have to kind of attempt to solve problems. And it was really fun. I learned a lot. Um, it was really like a, a deep dive into kind of Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley culture from a kind of an old school company that Fox is old school. I would consider engineering to this kind of Sil Silicon Valley. Everything moves super fast and um, everybody's, crawling to get their ideas uh, seen and heard. Um, and from Apple, uh, there was a lot of pivots on that project. So there was a lot of changes of direction and what they wanted to do. And the, the upper team was constantly kind of shifting the idea of what this autonomous car project would be. And they ended up kind of getting rid of this product that we had all been working on for quite some time. and. So they got rid of our test team, the reliability team. I guess I should explain what I was doing there, but so reliability engineering is basically, uh, hardware reliability is um, making sure that the products being developed are gonna be able to survive uh, in the field. So for us, for an autonomous car, that would be, you know, we're trying to put all these computers and LIDAR and sensors, cameras, radar, all this stuff in a vehicle that may typically not live on a vehicle. So different ways to, to harden these products and make sure that they're going to survive 100,000 miles, make sure they're going to survive out in the Arizona desert um, under extreme conditions that typically they're meant for like server farms or something like that. So designing lots of environmental tests, uh, coming up with countermeasures for, you know, certain silicon chips that are mounted to these boards need a certain sort of composite to go around it to hold it together. So I was doing all this reliability stuff um, and they were like, yeah, we're not really going to make a product anymore. So they cut off like 200, 250 of us uh, from that project. And they had offered me another role kind of with the main campus where they work on phones and consumer products. And it was going to involve me going over to China. So I didn't really want to spend six months in China every year. Um, so I, I took some time and went around and interviewed at these other autonomous car companies. Uh, and I ended up really liking the, the team that interviewed me at, at Aurora. Um, and I think their approach to kind of how autonomous cars are gonna evolve into the future is really smart. And so now I'm, I'm currently there working on, you know, very similar endeavors. So we're, they're making lots of hardware, they're developing their own in-house long range LIDAR uh, that I get to try to break and help robustify for kind of the future of autonomous cars. Do you, um, do you have to travel at Aurora? Before COVID, yeah. <laughs> I haven't been recently. Um, we, have, we have offices in Pittsburgh, um, an office in Bozeman, Montana, which I've really been wanting to go to. I like, heard the skiing is really nice up there. Um, and then one here in San Francisco. Um, 
I think someone is yeah, asking sorry, I mean, why you why you didn't want to go to China. Like, sounds pretty exciting to this group. Yeah, I think I think for me, I had done a bit of traveling for Fox and really enjoyed it. Got to go to Germany a bit. Got to go to Italy a bit. It was mm -hmm. really cool. Um, Spending, I would definitely love to go to China, but not spend six months over there. I would be in six months away from my wife, six months away, you know, from the family. So maybe if I was, I was a younger single person, that might make sense to spend a lot of time over there. But it just wasn't something I was ready to do. That makes sense. Um, you so you talked about your the work you did at Fox, the work you did at Apple, the work you're doing at Aurora. How would you compare working at those three different companies? Um, <clears throat> they've all definitely been quite different. Fox, you know, has been around since the seventies. They have lots of kind of momentum in the way that they do things. And they have these procedures that, you know, have been invented by an engineer who hasn't been there maybe for the last 10 or 15 years that we're continue to work off of. And there's lots, there's lots of kind of like, this is how we do things. This is how it's done, um, which is great because you get to see how, <clears throat> how a product is taken from idea to basically manufacturing production and then out to a consumer. And, you know, they do that every year with new products in a really tight timeline. So it's uh, incredibly impressive with a really complicated supply chain from Taiwan to the U S. Um, but so those processes are pretty much solidified and it's like, this is how we do things. Going to Apple, I'm sure on the main campus is very similar in that sense, but, um, on the special project, it was like, it was kind of like, nope. I mean, nobody's made an autonomous car. Nobody knows how to do it. Nobody knows how to, what the correct hardware is to pick. And so we were making up a lot of things. You know, as we were there, like, oh, they, this sounds like this is how we should do it. We should, you know, some use some engineering judgment, come up with some calculations to justify why we're doing certain things. But it was all new, and uh, that's really that can be really exciting and really stressful because you know you're not you always kind of second guess yourself, and now you're you're part of the engineering group that's coming up with you know maybe how things will continue to work into the future or not, and then. Moving to Aurora, which is not backed by, you know, a giant like Apple. Um, we have a lot of a good chunk of uh, venture capitalist money, you know, from Jeff Bezos from Amazon gave us some money to to uh, see this thing through and a handful of other big funding uh, giants kind of in Silicon Valley. But, you know, we have like a, a clock that's kind of ticking down. And we have to, you know, begin to show progress in a product. And um, so there's definitely kind of more more pressure on at, at Aurora than maybe at a place like Apple or Fox that has a product that they sell and make. So we don't, we're not making any money. We just, we're spending money. We'll continue probably to spend money for many years before we start making money. So that can be a bit stressful, but um, it's also exciting in the sense that you know kind of like apple this is just everything is very new and um you know I've taken on a lot of roles that i probably wouldn't take on in an established company where i'm setting up the new test lab you know just purchased a million dollars worth of test equipment um and i'm like are you sure you guys really want me to be specking all this stuff out i mean <laughs> we'll see uh it can be nerve-wracking but it's really fun it's like you're you're learning, uh, you know, you're kind of putting the deep end and you're learning very quickly. Um, does, I, I want to let the students ask questions if they have any. Um, I don't see anything in the chat, but if anybody has a question that they want to ask of Johnny, please feel free. People at Apple kind of like robots or are they real people? You know what I mean? <laughs> I just imagine them as all like worker ants that have no personalities, but I know that's not true because they it's run by humans. So, but what's it like? Like, do you make friends in there? Do they laugh? Do they smile? Do they like, you know, do they fart? Do they eat? <laughs> what do they do? <laughs> no, 
that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I think going in, I was kind of assuming the same thing. Uh, I was like, I was like, is this just a big corporate monster that, you know, everybody's yeah. kind of zoned into what they're doing. Um, but no, there's crazy creative people uh, that are working at Apple. And I think it really just depends on what team you land on. I think, I think you can find yourself. I mean, it's such a big company. There's like a hundred thousand employees worldwide. So like, I think, I think you could find yourself in a team that is going to be super creative, enthusiastic, uh, come up with really wild ideas. Um, but you can also find your, yourself on a team that is robotic and is just trying to churn through things and it could be completely miserable. So yeah, any, anytime you hear like maybe somebody who's worked at Apple who just says, Oh, that place is horrible or that place was incredible. It's going to be an incredible experience no matter what. Like you got to take that with just a grain of salt. The, your experience is going to vary just totally dependent on the team you, you end up on. Um, and it's something I think you kind of have to figure out jumping into a company that size. Um, do you still keep in touch with coworkers from Fox and Apple? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. So whenever uh, my current company, you know, <laughs> cuts me or crashes and burns in the future, it's always good to have a network behind you to uh, to be able to reach out to and see what's available. So, yeah, I still, you know, I still keep in contact with, I still go play golf with a lot of friends I made at Apple. Um, I still reach out all the time to friends and coworkers I made at Fox, you know, some now that are uh, directors at the company, which is blows my mind. I'm, <laughs> I'm like texting them, dude, what's up? You're, you're the director now. This is crazy. Um, so yeah, like continuing to keep, keep people that you've worked with, uh, as part of your group and reaching out when you can is really important. Um, and it keeps doors, you know, keeping doors open really for your work, your work life is important too. Um, does anyone else have a question they want to ask? Okay. I guess the only other thing I was thinking is, um, like, how much of what you learned in college are you using on your day-to-day -day job? Mm, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> more than I thought I would, honestly. Um, yeah, like <clears throat> plenty of times used uh, just a lot of it's coding. So a lot of a lot of coding classes I took at UCSE, um, I apply all the time. Um, a lot of mechanics, just basic mechanics things. <clears throat> um, materials engineering is pretty important for me, especially just talking talking about, you know, fatigue damage over a certain life of uh, some small computer component. And, and statistics, statistics has become very important. And the more I get into kind of this autonomous vehicle world, it pops up everywhere. So it pops up on the reliability side because we think of things in terms of how many modules are gonna fail in the field if we have a thousand trucks and they need to, you know, operate for four years, are we gonna see you know, how many failures are we going to see? How much is that going to cost the company? And then they pop up in the sense that um, they're used heavily in machine learning. So when you're trying to do some sort of regression analysis to see how uh, the input of some sensor um, affects kind of the perception and uh, the tagging of maybe a person or an object uh, in the road, so a lot of it comes down to kind of statistics and what the computer most likely thinks that is. So yeah, understanding those things is, is fair enough. There's another question really quickly in the chat because Aaron is here. Um, how does working for a company with unlimited resources and now working for one with probably not as many affect you? Any differences? Hmm. That's a really good question. So at Apple, there was always this joke that like we had a too much money problem. So when you have too much money, you 
you end up throwing money at the problem because that's the seems like the quickest and easiest way to go about it. <clears throat> but what you can end up with is, you know, a lot of these, like maybe a lot of technology that you purchased um, that's very cutting edge, but only a very few, you know, a very small number of people are going to be able to utilize it at the company. So now you've, you've kind of worked your way into a solution that, you know, might be a little bit better than another solution, but you've, cut off a big portion of the company to be able to utilize that solution. It's kind of a, a small example, but we ran into that a lot. Like Apple would go down some road and burn a ridiculous amount of money doing it. Um, and then all of it would basically be, okay, let's not do that. Uh, and, and it would be, it'd be wasteful and it'd also be a bit of like a, you know, morale, just a real cut to the morale because everybody had invested a lot of time and work into doing something uh, for it just to kind of be cut. And then whereas a company that, you know, has to care about uh, profits and care about losses and things, you feel like you're much more in the real world uh, when you're kind of talking about solutions and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's much more grounding, but, there's definitely obviously pros and cons to each of those things. You know, having a, having a ton of money and being able to get something done super fast can be uh, can be definitely definitely useful for for moving quickly. But um, yeah, I would say if you can spend some time at a company that has to worry about you know a product they're making and there's profits and margins and things involved, uh, it's that's definitely more of the real world than when you're at a massive company that can burn money, like maybe Google or Apple. Great. Thank you so much, Johnny, for speaking with the students. Yeah. It was Thanks great for to having see me. you again. Uh, please reach out if you have any questions. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. And uh, yeah, it's really exciting to, to be a part of this class, you know, 10 years ago and <laughs> people going through it. And yeah, it, it's a challenging road, but you all can do it. I believe in you. Thank you.